continue just, uh, I do want to at some stage, maybe next week, we'll get back to the I Am series because I'm not done with that. <clears throat> but I wanted to have my say on, on this, uh, uh, we've been talking about trust. And, uh, and I, I just wanted to share just something this morning, just a few thoughts on trusting in God. And in Proverbs chapter 3, a very well-known proverb that says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean on your, un under, on your own understanding in all of your ways. Acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. I think that trust is a, is a lesson that every Christian needs to learn. Trusting in God is a lesson that we have all got to learn and that we have all got to, to kind of run with. And uh, Faith, how we doing? Do we have somebody with us today? We do. Um, Faith has a newborn baby. Faith and Andrew, sorry, An Andrew had a part to play in it as well, didn't you? <laughs> Little Shiloh. Are you going to lift him out so everybody can see? Or don't, don't disturb him now. Ah, ah, look at him. Lovely. Congratulations. Um, you know, I, I, th I think the trust is, you know, when it comes to trusting God, an, an extremely valuable lesson, but an extremely difficult lesson to learn. Uh, it's, it's not really something that you can learn from a book. You can't just go pick out a book from a library um, on trust and you've got trust. Trust will only come through experience. And those experiences are difficult experiences. And that was, that's, that's what makes it such, I think, a, a difficult lesson to, to learn. But it's something that I believe is oh so valuable for us. You see, you see, trust requires that we give total, complete control over to, uh, uh, over to someone else of, of a situation, of an issue, of whatever it is. Trust requires that we give complete control of that issue and of that situation over to that person, and we don't interfere. Giving complete control means that it's yours I'm leaving it with you. And, and very often, maybe it's just me, but very often whenever it comes to God, it's like, God, I trust you. What, what if we were to do it this way, God? No, it's, I, I trust you, Lord. I trust you. I trust you. But, but what, if, what if this was to be the outcome? What, what, what if you were to move in this way? Lord, Lord I pray, I pray that, that this would happen. I, I trust you, Lord, but... I trust you, Lord, but, and trust is, God, I give everything over to you, no worries. And that's difficult to do. It's so difficult to walk out in life. It's easy to come to church on a Sunday and it's easy to sing about trusting God, but putting it into practice whenever things are going against you, whenever things aren't working out the way you wanted them to, the way you thought they would, then it's a little bit different. And so trust will only come through experience whenever we're faced with a situation that we want it to turn out this way, but we've got to say, God, you take control. Jesus, take the wheel. And sometimes we sit in the passenger seat and we're like, Jesus, you take the wheel, but we reach over and like, no, maybe we'll go this way a wee bit, Jesus. You know, let's, let's not go down that road. Let's, let's stick to this road. And then there becomes this, these altercations between ourselves and God on, on the outcomes that we want to see. And trust is saying, everything about the outcome of this situation is on you. I'm leaving it with you. It's trust, and it's difficult. It is so, so difficult that we don't have anything to do, don't take anything to do with the outcome of this situation. God, I'll leave it with you. In Hebrews chapter 11, you, you have this breakdown of these fathers, mothers of, of the faith, this hall of fame of faith, 
uh, and it gives this breakdown of, of, of these faithful men and women of God. And at the start of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the evidence of things not seen. Trust means that I don't see it, but I'm still going to trust you and I'm still going to believe in you for the outcome. And regardless of the outcome, I'm still going to believe in you. The outcome will not be what I want. The outcome will be leaving everything with you. Faith is the evidence of things not yet seen. And it gives a breakdown of, of, of these men and women of faith. And it talks about Noah. In verse 7 it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Noah, there's going to be a flood. There's going to be rain. And Noah's like, what's a flood? What's rain? Because they didn't really know what rain was. By faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Noah, I want you to build an ark. You want me to build a what? An ark, Noah, an ark. Okay, you're going to have to describe that to me because I don't know what that is. It's a big boat, Noah. A big what, God? A big boat. A boat. These are the things that would have been going on in Noah's life because Noah was being asked to do something and to build something he'd never seen before for reasons that he had never seen before. And it says, by faith, even though he hadn't seen it, he's building this ark under the instructions and guidance of God, being made to look like a fool in front of everyone else, in front of all his friends, in front of the community. Everyone that's coming, what are you building? No, I'm building an ark. What's an ark? What are you building that for? And Noah's beginning to explain to them that there's going to be a flood, that God's going to destroy this earth, and this is going to be your only salvation. And then they begin to make fun of him. Crazy Noah. But Noah didn't know what was, he hadn't read the book yet. The book hadn't even been written yet about his, about his life and about his story. But out of faith and trusting in God, things that he had never seen. He said, I'm trusting you, Lord. And he built it by faith. Having not yet seen, still built that ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would, would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So Abraham, or God calls Abraham from his life from a place where he was comfortable, from a place that he was familiar with, from a place that he knew. And he says, Abraham, I want you to leave there and I want you to go here. Somewhere he'd never been before. A place he didn't know, a place that was unfamiliar. But Abraham trusted God. He trusted God. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen over here. Here, I know what's going to happen. Here, I've got control. Over here, it's something new. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to trust you, God. Further on down, it talks about how Abraham was called of God to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham doesn't know what's going on. Again, Abraham hadn't read the story. The story hadn't been written yet. He's living it out. And we're told that he, he gathers the wood for the fire, for the sacrifice. And he takes Isaac up a mountain to sacrifice him. And he's ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, not knowing what's going on. He doesn't know that there's going to be, that God's going to call him to stop. He doesn't know that that's going to happen. And it had taken years for Abraham and his wife to conceive a son. He was a son of promise. It had taken years for this to happen. So Abraham's like, well, if, if he dies, I, I don't know. They're going to need another miracle here. But in faith, not knowing what the outcome would be, Abraham trusts in God. These weren't, weren't things that, that these men could, could, could read about. Yeah, well, I've read about trust, so I trust. It had to come through their experiences in life, through not knowing what the outcome would be, through not knowing what the end of this journey would hold. I think we struggle to trust God if we're being brutally, brutally honest. I think we struggle at times to trust. 
I think that we want to take control. And I think that sometimes we end up in situations that are so hurtful. I think sometimes we end up in situations that are soul-destroying, that it's in those moments that we struggle to trust God. And this, this is kind of what I want to get to. I, I listen to people's stories, and I look across this room, and I, and I know a lot of stories in this room of where a lot of people have been and where a lot of people have come from. And been through really, really difficult situations that I could never even begin to imagine what that would be like. And sometimes in those moments, it's not even just a struggle just to trust God, but maybe sometimes we're kind of like, God, where are you in all of this? And maybe there's a blaming of God in all of this, that you could have done more, God, that you could have moved, that you could have, have prevented this, and he doesn't. I think that we struggle in those moments. I know that I do. Because we want the outcome to be different. And we want the outcome to be our way and not God's way. And we dream up of these different outcomes and different scenarios that if we were in charge, then this is what would happen. And trust is, no, give it all to God. Let him sort it. Let him have his way. And we don't interfere. But sometimes then that means, in fact, very often going through hurt and pain, rejection. But the thing about trust is that if we don't learn to trust him, if we don't learn to trust him fully, then it will lead to a rebellion. It will lead to a rebellion. If we don't learn to trust God with everything, then we will take control ourselves, and that is rebellion. We're doing it our own way. God's way is not good enough. We're not going to trust Him. Therefore, I'll do it this way, because this way is better, and that's living in rebellion. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, there, there's, in fact, there's a lot of this where, where God is referring back to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel very often were called a stiff-necked people who didn't trust the Lord. And in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 23, it says, When the Lord sent you out from Kadesh Barnea, he said, Go up and take possession of the land I have given you. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord. You did not trust him or obey him. So we know the story, we have shared the story with you many times, how that the children of Israel weren't just brought out of Egypt just to be freed from Egypt, but they were freed from Egypt because God had a promise for them. He had a promised land for them, the land of Canaan. And so they come to a point where God is telling them, go take possession of the land. And they send out spies into the land and, and 10 of them come back with a, with a bad report. We can't take this. There's giants in the land. And two, Joshua and Caleb are saying they came back with a good report. They believed the promises of, the promises of God. But all, all the camp then and listening to the 10 with this negative report said, we can't take it. And so they walked away from the promises they, and they rebelled against God. Whenever we don't trust God, we will do our own thing and we will rebel against God. This was the history of the children of Israel constantly wanting to do their own thing because they wouldn't trust God. Maybe you're here in this place and maybe God has done you wrong or you feel like God has done you wrong. Maybe you look over your life and you're thinking this happened, and that happened, and this other thing happened. My goodness, I, I know the story. I'm with you. I'm with you because I know I've, I've seen it. I've been a part of some of your stories. I've seen what has happened, things that should never, ever have happened. Maybe you can look back over your life and question what happened there. My answer to you is, number one, I don't know, but number two, God is going to spend eternity making it up to you. God is going to spend the whole of eternity making it up to you. All of your brokenness, all of your hurt, all of your pain, 
the rejection that has happened in your life, the things that you have suffered, suffered the loss, God is going to spend eternity making it up to you. That as we pass through that doorway of death, that doorway into eternity, into the very presence of Almighty God where we will come face to face with Jesus Christ, He's going to make it up to us. He's going to make it up to you. And He's going to spend eternity doing it. Oh, take us home, Lord. And so here's my thing. What is, our going to, what is our response going to be when it does all go wrong? What is our response going to be when the situation is messed up and is out of our control? What is our response going to be? How are we going to handle those things? How are we going to handle those situations? How are we going to handle those issues? Are we going to take control and try and sort it out ourselves? Or are we going to give it to God? I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. Let me share a story very quickly about a man called Job. A lot of you will know Job's story. Job, we're told, was a wealthy man, a rich man. In, in chapter 1, of his story in, in this book of Job, it says, There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. In other words, if you've seen Job, the people were living with Job in, in Job's city, in Job's town, in his village, who knew Job would look at Job and knew there's a man of great integrity. There is a man who is blameless, a man who is upright. You, you, could, you couldn't find much better than Job. Job was a good guy, a God-fearing man who trusted God, who believed God, who followed God, who didn't do anything wrong in his life. And so what's about to happen to Job? Job didn't deserve it to happen to him. Not only was Job full of integrity and blameless and upright, but Job was extremely wealthy. Job was stinking filthy rich. He had so much wealth laid up for him. And in an instant, it all changes. Job was married with a number of children. He had all these homes and camels and livestock. He had it all. If Job was alive today, he'd probably be a billionaire. He had everything. And uh, in an instant, everything changed. Everything changed as reports began to come into Job. Job, there was this wind that blew through and, and, and the house up in the countryside, it fell in. All of your children were there with their friends. It caved in on them and they're all dead. Job, there was a fire that burned and it consumed all of the livestock. All of your livestock is dead. There's another report about other, other livestock that he had. And everything in a day, in an instant, everything is gone. His sons, his daughters, his livestock, his wealth, his homes, it's gone in an instant. In a moment, it's gone. Isn't it crazy how life can change in a moment? Isn't it crazy how life can change? How one minute, everything's great. And in an instant, you get a phone call. In an instant, someone knocks on the door. In an instant, everything changes and everything falls apart. Everything falls apart. What would our response be to that? What would our response be to everything that happened to Job, happening to us? This blameless and upright guy who could turn around and say, God, what's going on here? I, I, I'm blameless, I'm upright, I've served you all the days of my life. I don't deserve this to happen. Why are you allowing this to happen to me? Having spent my years serving you, obeying you, following you, and this is what I get? What's that about God? Verse 20, Job stood up, tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head 
fell to the ground to worship. What should our response be? I think our response should be to worship. Worship team, come. I think that everything that we go through, our response should always be to worship. Job had a number of of voices contributing to his life. One of them was, was, was his wife. And it's, it's kind of crazy how you think that, you know, it's bad enough that Job lost everything. And Job, his response is to worship. And then you would think, well, if we've responded in the right way, if I have worshipped, then something's going to change. Something will change, but not instantly. Not just because you come out here on a Sunday and you begin to worship that all of a sudden God's going to move. Yes, God moves in an instant. In the same way that there was an instant that messed it up, God can move in an instant that brings it back together again where there's redemption. But Job responds in worship in chapter one. In chapter two, it actually gets worse because Job ends up covered in in sores, covered head to toe in boils. So you imagine this millionaire, this billionaire who had everything, everything stored up for him, everything laid up for him, absolutely everything going for him, loses it all, ends up sitting by a tree, by the side of a house, by a building, sitting out in the sunshine, sitting out in the open, covered in boils, head to toe, where he is so sore that he's actually scraping his skin with broken pieces of pottery. That's how bad this has got for Job, this blameless and upright man who didn't deserve this to happen to him. And yet it does. Job's response is to worship. And he's got these voices contributing to his life. One of them is, is his wife. And his wife begins to question, are you still trying to maintain your integrity, Job? After everything that has happened here, you're still trying to maintain your integrity. Why don't you just curse God and die? Things have gotten this bad, Job. Look at the state that you're in. Look at the condition that you're in. Look at everything that has happened. You're sitting there now covered in boils, scraping the very skin from your body. Curse God and die. And Job again responds, Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job did nothing wrong, said nothing wrong. Should we only accept the good things from God and nothing bad? Job had this understanding. He says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I guess the question is, are we only in this whole Christianity thing just for what we can get from God? Are we only following Jesus just because we think it's going to be good and uh, when it goes wrong, then we'll do our own thing? Job understood. Yeah, God's going to bless us. And, And I'm not just going to worship God just in the good times. I'm also going to worship Him in the bad. That's going to be my response. My response is going to be to worship him because regardless of my circumstances, he is still God. While my circumstances may change, he doesn't. He's the God of the valley and he's the God of the mountaintop. He's the God when things are going well and he's also the God when things aren't going too good in my life. He never changes. He is the same yesterday today and forever. So when it's going good, I'm going to worship Him. When it's going good, I'm going to praise Him. When it's going good, I'm going to follow Him. When it's going good, I'm going to trust Him. When it's messed up, I'm going to worship Him. When it's messed up, I'm going to praise Him. When it's messed up, I'm still going to trust my God. As you read through Job's story, 
there are these discussions that take place between him and some friends. They're trying to understand what's going on in Job's life. They had this belief that Job wasn't so upright and blameless that he led on to be, that there was sin in his life and there was a reason why things went wrong in his life. There was this theology that they held that wasn't true and still isn't. And at the end of the book, the end of his story, Job has a discussion with God. <laughs> it's kind of crazy because you kind of feel like, or I feel like, Job deserves an explanation as to why this has happened in his life. I don't, do, you, do you ever feel like you deserve an explanation? I feel sometimes, God, you got to explain this to me. I think I deserve some kind of an explanation here. And you kind of think that if God's going to speak to Job, then God will explain to Job, okay, Job, look, this is, let me break this down for you. This is what happened. This is why this happened. It doesn't exactly happen. God's kind of response to Job is, Job, who do you think you are to question me? Who, who do you think you are, Job? And he begins to ask Job these questions. Job, were you there whenever I created this universe? Were you there when I put the stars into the sky? Were you there whenever I created the oceans? Were you there whenever I held the oceans back from coming on to the land? Job, were you there? In other words, what God was doing to Job was saying, Job, listen, I'm God. I know what I'm doing. You, you may not know. You may never find out. But you got to trust me. I know what I'm doing. I've done all of this stuff, this universe, everything to do with it. I, I did all that, Job. I know what I'm doing, Job. Who are you to question me? <laughs> Sometimes I still do. But who am I to question God? Should we only ever accept the good things from God and never anything bad? In chapter 13 of verse 15, or sorry, chapter 13 and, and verse 15 of, of Job's story. Job gives this remarkable, again, another remarkable response. And not knowing what's going on, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I, I don't know what's going on, but I trust him. I know that this is messed up and I've gotten no understanding of why it's happening, but I'm trusting him. I'm following him. Though he slay me, I trust him. Though he slay me, I'll worship him. Though he slay me, I'll praise him. I will trust him. And at the end of the story, Job actually, whenever it comes to his possessions and his wealth, gets more than what he started with. He gets more than what he started with. Why? Because he trusted and because his response was to worship. See, we sing a song. And I'm almost done. And the song goes, in the middle of the storm, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. When it comes to worship, we talked a number of weeks ago about a sacrifice of worship. And there is pain sometimes at the altar of worship. There's a story of a woman who comes to Jesus She's carrying an alabaster jar of perfume, an alabaster box of perfume worth a, a year's wages, worth an absolute fortune. What she carried in her hands cost 
what she carried in her hands was valuable. And she brings it and she breaks it open and she pours it on the head of Jesus as an act of worship. It cost her. It cost her. But she comes to Jesus and she pours it out. She pours out her worship. And I want to tell you today that there is breakthrough in worship. There is breakthrough in worship. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. I've had my most intimate moments with God in pain. In pain. Where there are times where I've been on my knees crying out to God in the middle of different meetings and services, crying out to God, sweat dripping off me, tears flowing down, trying to understand things, trying to wrap my head around things, but pouring out worship to God. Because there's breakthrough in worship. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. I, I used to look at that and think... I put the emphasis on singing. I put the emphasis on worship and it's right that we do that. Last night, as I was preparing this, God put my emphasis on the word middle. It's just the middle. It's just the middle, church. It's just the middle. Come on, somebody get this. You're just in the middle. The end hasn't been written yet. It's just the middle. It's the middle of the storm. It's the middle of the mess. It's not the end. It's just the middle. The end has yet to be written. You're just in the middle. You're in the middle of the storm, but it's just the middle. There's an end, there's a breakthrough. There's something still to come. The story has not yet been finalized. The story has not yet been ended. There's still another chapter to be written. It's just the middle church. It's just the middle. And so we worship in the middle because the worship will bring breakthrough. Don't let anybody take your worship. Don't let anybody take your voice. Don't let anybody take those gifts that God has given to us. Worship is warfare, church. I'm going to sing. I'm going to worship in the middle of the storm because it's just the middle and worship is going to lead me to break through. Worship is going to lead me into the next chapter. I'm going to sing. I'm going to worship. I'm going to trust. Will you stand to your feet, church? Job's response was the worship. I can never overemphasize the importance of worship. Worship requires a vulnerability. Worship requires an openness. As we were singing this morning, I began to write down about the guarded heart. I know that the Bible tells us, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart, for out of it, out of it, out of your heart flows life. Guard your heart. I know that the Word of God tells us that we've got to understand the context of that, what exactly that means. But sometimes for a lot of us, guarding our heart means building walls between ourselves and other people, and between ourselves and God. And God wants you to take away those guards. Take away those barriers and be open and vulnerable before Him in worship. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. That means trusting Him in the middle of the storm. That means taking away those barriers in the middle of the storm. Trusting Him to get us through the middle and to get us to the next chapter. As Matt was singing this morning, return home, return home. I thought about the children of Israel and how they were in exile for 70 years. They were away from their nation 
from their land, from their country, from their home for 70 years. And then God returned them home. Their time of exile was up and they returned home. And sometimes whenever we return home, whenever we return to God, we return a little bit more guarded because we've had the, the life experience of exile, the life ex experience of living outside of home that we bring those experiences with us and maybe there's a, a struggle to trust because we might end up in exile again. And so as we return home, that means returning to the heart of God, but returning with 100% complete total trust in Him. Heart to heart, vulnerable before God. Return home, church. Be vulnerable before Him. Do not live a guarded life before God. Live with an open and trusting heart before God and allow Him, allow the Holy Spirit to move in you. Let's worship in these next kind of five, ten minutes. Let's just worship Him, church. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, then take this moment just to say, God, come and save me. Come and save me, Lord. Come and have your way in my life. And then you go and you talk to someone, you tell someone, I became a Christian today. I prayed. I asked God to save me. You tell someone that you know as a Christian, if you don't know anybody, then you come and see me. Let's just be open and vulnerable for Him for the next five minutes, church. Let's worship Him.